bit more into it. Okay, so uh, because I invited myself to this, <laughs> I'm going to introduce myself and I'm not gonna wait the traditional five minutes before getting started because I actually have never given this talk before. So I have no idea how long it's gonna take. I already cut out several slides when I practiced it. So I'm afraid it's gonna take time. Okay, so- but You should praise yourself profusely. I, <laughs> I will come across one way or the other on my talk. <laughs> I welcome myself to this. So this is the first time I removed my mask, even though we've had the permission to do this for a while, but at least, you know, I'm on camera here. I will do that. Let me just say, my name is Gerard Detesham. I'm a professor in this department and I'm biomechanics. So as a biomechanics person, you may be surprised why am I talking about phase transformation and thermodynamics? Because in my field of biomechanics, I've been very interested in reactive processes that occur in biological tissues. So though I'm trained really as a continuum mechanics person looking at solid mechanics, fluid mechanics, I've had to look at uh, physical chemistry and biology and biochemistry. And this process, I always wanted to follow my traditional continuum mechanics approach as I tried to solve these problems in biology and biochemistry. So I've come to apply a lot of thermodynamics in my own research, but usually thermodynamics of mixtures usually under isothermal conditions, because that's what the human body and, you know, not a mammalian, you know, uh, uh, studies re really are usually done at uniform temperature. But one year I had to teach advanced thermodynamics in this department. And it was great because when you teach a topic, you realize that it's not enough to understand it sufficiently well. You need to tie all the loose ends. So I wanna say that in my presentation today, I'm gonna to talk about a lot of thermodynamics that you should have seen before, one way or the other. I'm gonna give you the perspective of the continuum mechanics approach to thermodynamics. But also what I wanna say is that I'm gonna tie a few loose ends and they turn out to be critical for the only novelty that I have in this presentation. I already took out several slides. So the only novelty that I have is the phase transformation mass flux. How do you evaluate the rate at which something evaporates or condenses? And that's gonna be the main topic of my presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna get started with my talk. Uh, so, and I'm gonna do a few things here. <laughs> Sorry, I have to. So, um, Here's an experiment I found on YouTube. There's like dozens of videos of this kind where somebody took a bottle of water, they put it in the fridge, or they discovered this by accident by leaving their bottle of water in their car when there were sub-zero temperature outside. And then when they picked up the water bottle, it started freezing. I like this video because it shows you what we normally would say is irreversible process, irreversible thermodynamics. This phase transformation is occurring very fast. It's also an interfacial event, right? You start at a surface and this surface, the ice now propagates, right? As an interface. So it's important to understand that a lot of phenomena in phase transformations are interfacial events. So therefore I'm gonna focus a lot on interfacial events when I get to it, okay. The other thing I want to say, I'm probably going to forget everything that I want to say, but I'll remember and I'll come back. <laughs> Here's a phase diagram for water. Uh, I took it from Wikipedia. So this phase diagram for water, let me summarize the few key points I want to remind you of. Water can exist as a vapor, as a liquid, or as a solid, which we call ice. And actually, the liquid phase cannot exist below the triple point, right? So te technically you can only have vapor and you know, solid all the way down to zero pressure and temperature. Actually it's zero pressure. There's no vapor left because it has to completely expand. Okay, this is what we call the saturation curve. The saturation curve between the liquid and the vapor. I'm gonna focus on liquid transformations, not the liquid ice, liquid vapor, because the equations are easier. Ice is a solid. I don't wanna complicate your life with solid mechanics, only fluid mechanics. So keep that in mind. So I will focus on this curve. I also want to remind you that at atmospheric pressure, then we know that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius and it freezes at zero degrees Celsius. That's what this red line represents. So the fact that when you have 
your bottle of water that stays in the fridge. Remember the temperature in your freezer is negative five degrees Celsius typically for your freezer at home. Freezer in the lab could be negative 20, 25 degrees. Freezer in a biochemistry lab could be negative 80 degrees Celsius, but a freezer at home is about negative five degrees Celsius. You take that bottle of water, you put it in the freezer, the temperature out, outside the water bottle is below freezing. So if this experiment works correctly, and if you actually watch this video, this experiment fails often, but when it works correctly, you take the bottle carefully out, the temperature of the water is already below freezing. You shake it a little bit, you cause some kind of phenomenon at the interface and suddenly the ice starts forming. Okay, so it's important to realize that this video is showing you that we're starting from what we call the metastable state of super cooled water. When water is cooled below its freezing temperature as we know it, which would be zero degrees Celsius, it can exist. It's not like some new discovery. It's a well-known phenomenon. It's called a super cooled fluid. So I hope I remembered everything. Oh yeah. And then there's a critical point. This particular figure doesn't show what happens below, beyond the critical point, but Beyond the critical point, there's no difference between liquid and vapor water. It's called uh, supercritical fluid, okay? <laughs> Good. Okay, so phase transformations. You actually took your old mechanical engineers, you took an undergraduate course in thermodynamics, and there was a lot of talk about wet steam, evaporating water, superheated steam, which means there are no more wet liquid droplets in it. But did you, do you remember a formula for figuring out the rate at which the steam evaporates? The answer is probably no, because it's not covered in your thermodynamic textbooks. I went back and I double checked. It doesn't exist. There's nothing there. So you search the literature, what do you find? You find that the evaporation and condensation of water is really described using statistical thermodynamics. The person that I found that seems to be an expert on this field is Charles Ward, now an emeritus professor at the University of Toronto has done some work. He um, has, uh, by reading his papers, I realized that the classical relations date back to Hertz from the 1880s and Knudsen from the early 20th century, 1916. And then more recently, Schwab, 1951, a student, a PhD student from Columbia. So the hertz nutson formula says that the molar flux for the phase transformation, let's say evaporation for the sake of argument. So the rate at which we, you know, water evaporates is dependent on, allow me to turn on my laser pointer. This is the molar mass of water. This is the Boltzmann constant. This here shows that the temperature in the liquid at the interface and the temperature in the vapor at the interface are not the same because actually here's a picture of experimental measurements. This is the interface between liquid and vapor. This is the temperature. There's a jump in the temperature when there's actually a phase transformation taking place. That already goes against what you were told in your thermodynamics class, which is that phase transformations occur at constant pressure and temperature. It's not true. There's a jump in the temperature. Okay. Keep that in mind, it's gonna be important. So the formula takes into account that there's a liquid and a vapor temperature at the interface that are different. There's a vapor pressure, then the pressure on the saturation curve, but evaluated at the temperature of the liquid enters into this formula. Then there are these fudge parameters called the condensation coefficients or the evaporation coefficients. This one is the condensation. This is the evaporation. There is no direct way of getting these except through experimental data. So this is the current formula that is used until today. This paper is from 2016, you see. Uh, so 2016 is pretty recent. That's the way that we figure out the evaporation or condensation of water. Now, for those of us who there's some is this in a case where there's no um, uh, sorry <laughs> convection thank you so um, oh, yeah. so 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 there is always free convection because of the gradient in temperature and buoyancy then you're going to have the vapor is going to move in one direction the liquid whatever is not going to move as much due to gravity so yes it is in the presence of convection but these measurements are average for any fluctuations. So you don't need to worry about the fact that the flow is locally a little bit, you know, okay. terribly. Okay, so one this- One more question about yes. the you'll address that. But the temperature of the liquid seems to be decreasing and the vapor seems to be increasing. If I'm reading it correctly. Yes, yes, I'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll get to that in my time. I'm already like behind yes. on slide number two. 
What am I going to contribute in this presentation? Uh, the abstract for this talk offered more. I don't have time, but I'm going to specifically talk about metastable equilibria, such as that super cooled liquid that you saw in that ice bottle, uh, water bottle experiment. And I'm going to introduce a mass flux equation that doesn't look at all like the Hertz Nazi. That's the main novelty of my presentation. Okay. Uh, and this consistent model that I'm going to introduce will satisfy the second law of thermodynamics. Now let's talk about continuum mechanics, things that I teach in my graduate level classes. So axiom of mass balance is the rate of change of mass in a control volume. Here's a control volume. Control volume is an open system. You allow the material to flow in and out. The material could be solid, it could be fluid. It doesn't have to be one or the other. At this point, we're making no distinction between solid and fluid or anything else, as long as it's matter. Okay, so rate of change of mass in the control volume is equal to the rate at which the mass is convected into that control volume. You take this word statement, you convert it into an integral statement. Rho is the mass density, V is the velocity of the matter, and N is the outward normal to the boundary of your control volume. Then you use the divergence theorem and you turn the integral statement into a differential statement. Here the dot represents a material time derivative. Okay, material time derivative. This orange curve is the differential statement of the conservation of mass. Now, this is what everyone has seen in the fluid mechanics course. Let me explain this. Normally, we tell you if the fluid is incompressible, its density doesn't change. So, rho dot is zero. So, you're told that the divergence of the velocity is zero. Okay, that's for incompressible flow. However, I will not do incompressible flow here because I need to include vapor. Now comes the part which is less familiar to people who do fluid mechanics. In solid mechanics, only for people who do finite deformation, it's a well-known fact that based on the kinematics of the continuum, you can actually relate the volume ratio. The volume ratio is the determinant of the deformation gradient. It simply means the current volume over the referential volume, that's J. Kinematically, you can relate it to the divergence of the velocity through this relation. This has nothing to do with a constant model. This is not a conservation law. This is purely a kinematic relation. So J dot is the rate of change of the volume. Obviously, if you don't allow the volume to change, which means the fluid is incompressible, then J dot is zero. Then the divergence of V is zero once again. Okay. Now let me solve for the divergence of V as J dot over J. And let me substitute this back into here. Then I get this relation. And I can rearrange this by multiplying across by J into a total differential saying that rho J dot is equal to zero which I can integrate and say that it's equal to a constant, which means we found a solution to this differential equation, which is the conservation of mass. It says that rho times J is equal to a constant. That constant is the referential mass density when J is equal to one. When the current volume is the referential volume, then J is equal to one. So J serves as a wonderful measure of volumetric strain that we can use to write constitutive models. Instead of using volume, which is an extensive variable or specific volume, which is the reciprocal of the mass density, we can use the volume ratio, which is strain. So we can do stress strain relations, but for fluids, just like we can do for solids. Okay. And this now, is valid, Gerard, for any differential volume. Yes, any differential volume. That's correct. That was VJ asking the question. Right. Axiom of momentum balance is also known as Newton's second law of motion. I'm only going to show you linear momentum balance, but I'll explain why. So it says the rate of change of linear momentum is equal to the rate at which the linear momentum is convected into the control volume plus the sum of surface and body forces. So here's the linear momentum is mass, which is mass density times volume times velocity. That's linear momentum integrated over the control volume is the total linear momentum in the control volume. This is its rate of change is equal to the linear momentum convected into the control volume plus the sum of surface forces and body forces. Sigma here is a tensor. It's called the Cauchy stress. That's the stress that you learned about in solid mechanics. And V is the specific body force, body force per mass, such as if the body force is mg, then g, the, the gravitational vector, would be equal to b. Okay. So what other body forces. Electromagnetic forces are the most other common body forces. And so we apply the divergence theorem, and we end up with this form of the linear momentum balance. The angular momentum balance also tells you that as long as you satisfy linear momentum balance, the stress tensor needs to be symmetric. If the stress tensor is symmetric, you automatically satisfy angular momentum balance. There's 
a missing piece of information here. I'll share it with you in a second. Now, let me tell you something that people in thermodynamics don't do. Everybody in thermodynamics uses absolute pressure whenever they do thermodynamics. But in continuum mechanics, the stress is not the absolute stress in your matter. In a solid, like this chair that you're sitting in, I assume that if nobody is sitting in this chair, I'm going to assume that this chair in its unloaded state has zero stress in it. That's a reference configuration I've arbitrarily picked. And then when someone is sitting in it, then I can figure out the stresses. Why do I do this? Because there is no way for me to know if there are residual stresses in this chair due to the manufacturing process or someone sitting on it and bending the piece of metal, someone too heavy or whatever. I don't know because it's not possible to observe the state of stress. You cannot measure the state of stress. Stress is a tensor. You cannot measure a tensor. You can only measure scalars and vectors. Right? But it can be due to gravity. Uh, body force also, right, Gerard? I'm sorry? The body forces can lead to stresses. Yes, they could also lead to stresses. So I'm neglecting the body force when I say this is my reference. Got it. Absolutely. Yeah. So now, this concept, which is very common in fluid and solid mechanics, I'm just saying the same principle applies in fluid mechanics. So from this point on, let's accept that the stress, if we have a special case where we have a fluid and the stress represents a hydrostatic pressure, then the pressure is really the gauge pressure. This point is not emphasized anywhere in my opinion, although someone like Arvind is probably familiar with this concept. I just wanna say, these are things that I taught myself when I finally had to teach this material to students. I realized these are the little loose ends that need to be tied. Okay. And then if you wanna go back to absolute pressure, now you need to specify what is your reference pressure, right? You want it to be atmospheric pressure, great. You want it to be the triple point pressure, which is more common in thermodynamics, then let this PR represent the triple point pressure. Now that, remember, we already had a reference density, mass density in the previous slide. So reference mass density, reference pressure, and now we also need a reference temperature will represent our reference state in thermodynamics. Okay, so that's the action of linear momentum balance. The action of energy balance is also known as the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics says the rate of change of internal plus kinetic energy is equal to the heat supplies plus the rate of work of surface and body forces, whatever gets. Okay, so now the equation is a bit longer. U is my specific internal energy, which means internal energy per mass. And this is the convected, uh, and one half V dot V times the mass is the kinetic energy. Okay, so that's that, and that's the time rate of change. That's the part that's convected in. This is the heat flux. Now, N is the outward normal. So heat entering my control volume needs to have a negative sign. Heat flux is a vector that represents, like if I had a blowtorch and I started heating up the stable, heat will flow from the location that I'm heating. That's a vector. That's what this heat flux represents. Then there's this heat supply which I will tell you more about. You could also have heat generated within the medium. How is it generated? We'll get to it in a second. Plus the rate of work of surface forces and body forces. Okay. So then you apply the divergence theorem. Once again, you get a very nice simple compact form. Rate of change of the internal energy is equal to, we call this the stress power density. And this is the divergence of the heat flux. So, and this is the heat supply. In other words, if the heat flux is diverging, then divergence of Q is positive. If the heat flux is converging, then negative divergence of Q means it's positive, okay? Then the heat flux is converging. When the heat flux is converging, you increase the internal energy in that location, okay? Or if you have a source of heat at that location, you're gonna increase the internal energy. It's as simple as that. Or if you have a piston, and gas in it and the piston chamber, you're pushing on it mechanically, that's the stress, that's the rate at which you're pushing, you're gonna store internal energy in your system, you understand? That's how continuum mechanics works. It agrees exactly with what we learned in our undergraduate thermodynamics. Now let me, yes, please go ahead. Uh, I, um, is this for a pure substance? Yes. Yes, okay. But I'm gonna to touch upon it right now. So, what is the specific internal heat supply? Let's say you want to model your fluid or your solid as a pure substance. I want uh, to model copper as an elastic solid. But if I pass an electric current through copper, I'm going to generate heat. We call that Joule heating. Do I want to model copper as a mixture of 
protons that are fixed and electrons that flow? I can't. I could do that. That's a mixture analysis. I have two constituents. One is positively charged, one is negatively charged. In which case, the mixture analysis automatically tells me, hey, you need a friction between those two. That friction will generate here. And that's Julie thing. So if you do the mixture analysis for that, then you don't need to put R for Julie thing. It comes out naturally from your model. But if you choose to ignore the constituents, then you don't need to put R. The same is true for microwave heating. I don't know if you know how microwave heating works. Press the button. <laughs> Press the button. <laughs> so why, why do you heat it? Because of the water, right? What causes the micro? Why does the microwave actually heat the water? Okay, follow me. I know I'm going to waste a lot of time. I don't care. Uh, here, you electric dipole. The water molecule is an electric dipole. It has zero electric charge. You put it in an electromagnetic field, and as the electromagnetic field is oscillating, the dipole moment is going to be applied on the water molecule. It's going to make it rotate. When a water molecule rotates, it actually creates friction with the neighboring water molecule because they could be rotating as well. But you know, it's not like the, the it's not like the gears. They don't rotate in unison. So there's friction between them. We call this friction the rotational viscosity. Have you ever heard of rotational viscosity? Not unless you were an expert in polar fluid mechanics, polar continuum theory, not taught to anyone. It's, you have to go back to the literature to the Kosara brothers from the early 1900s. Luckily, one of my close friends from the city college of the city of University of New York, Professor Steve Cowan published papers on this topic in the 1960s and 70s. I met him when he was doing bone mechanics, but I went back and I read his papers. So unless you decide to model polar fluid mechanics, which means you need to add a rotational degree of freedom, which means you need to make your stress tensor non-symmetric, unless you choose to do that, you will not be able to model naturally the heat produced by microwave heating unless you artificially introduce this R as an externally supplied value. You understand? This subtlety not explained in any textbook as far as I know. Okay, I want you to understand. That's one of those loose ends that I'm tying. Okay. Yes, Jim. Why can't I just call it an absorption? You can call it whatever you want. People call it radiation. Yes. But usually R stands for radiation. That's why it's been called that. But what I'm trying to say is the only heat that you see in your undergraduate thermodynamics textbook is this R. It's called capital Q usually. Well, or Q dot rather. Okay, I just want you to know that. Why? And we're going to get to it. Hey, so Gerard, one I, quick question, Gerard. I'm sorry. Vijay, here, very quick question. Yes. Have you assumed something about equilibration of pressure quickly within this equation? No. So, so pressure is valid under the most general conditions. Okay, so pressures can be not under equilibrium condition for this to exist. Correct. Okay, thank you. And then where where does um uh, what about phase transitions? Is that encapsulated well, we in the? That. We're like I'm like we may not get to it. Ten percent into my talk, and I'm, I'm already. No, but is that is that counted <laughs> in the is that counted in the source? Or is that counted? <laughs> Lando and the like give, me, give me a second. I'll all get right, to it. All right. Let's okay. talk, talk, continue, please. Let's talk about the second law of thermodynamics, which we call the axiom of entropy inequality. In modern continuum mechanics, we use axioms because we know that tomorrow someone can come along like Einstein and discover that what we thought was true is not true. Okay. Anyway, what does it say? It says that the rate of change of entropy in your control volume the rate of change is always greater than the rate at which entropy is convected by mass into the control volume, entropy is convected by heat flux into the control volume, or entropy is generated by the heat sources within the control volume. That's what it says. And when you put that in the integral statement, it's actually a fairly short statement. This is the total entropy. So now S is the specific entropy per mass times the mass, which is rho dV. Time rate of change of that is the entropy convected into the control volume. This is the entropy convected by the heat flux. It's heat flux divided by the temperature with a negative sign because N is positive outward. And this is the entropy generated by the heat supplies that we arbitrarily assigned as I explained. Okay. How come the stress tensor is not equal to Oh, it doesn't show up. No, I'll show you in a second where it shows up. Okay, because all of this is 
So the second law doesn't actually bring the stress tensor like that. It brings it in a second. This is a differential statement. Now, contrary to everything that I explained to you, conservation of mass, momentum, energy, which have been known for a long time. We don't know who invented conservation of mass. We know conservation of linear momentum is Newton. Conservation of energy is not named after anyone because we assume that was been known for a long time. Second law of thermodynamics, mostly resolved by the end of the 19th century, okay? But this differential statement that I'm showing you was proposed by this guy, Clifford Truesdale in 1952. So the continuum mechanics approach to the second law is not so old. For some of the young students here, it's just as old as Hertz or Knudsen or Newton. But for me, my parents were living in the 1950s. Yeah, that's the difference, okay? I wasn't born yet. <laughs> I just want to clarify. Okay, <laughs> so then comes along Bernard Coleman and Walter Knoll. Yeah, Col uh, let me not give you too much history. Anyway, those guys made a very important discovery in 1963, given the equation that Truesdale had now started sharing in the continuum rational mechanics community, he called it. Uh, then they said, okay, we can use this inequality because it's not an equation. You solve equations, you don't solve inequalities. Inequalities are inequalities. So they said, we use them to constrain the functions of state which appear in the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. The, what are they? They're the stress, right? Which you know shows up in the momentum. This internal energy, which shows up in the uh, energy balance. The heat flux, which shows up in the energy balance. And the entropy, which shows up in the entropy inequality. Okay. They proposed this in 1963. Now, I was born in 1963. So that's about the, my time. How do we relate this to undergraduate thermodynamics? If you remember, you were always told that the temperature is uniform in each reservoir in your undergraduate thermodynamics class. Well, if, you, if the temperature is uniform, you can take it out of this integral, put it outside, you can take it out of this integral. Then remember, all of this is the total entropy, we call it capital S, and DDT becomes the material time derivative. You took out the one over T, this material time derivative contains the convective term because it's a material time derivative. And so now what you're left with is, this is that what would normally be called delta Q dot in your undergraduate textbook, okay? It's a combination of the heat flux and the heat supply from internal sources, but only if the temperature is uniform. So then you recover this classical textbook relation, but you don't need to use a classical textbook relation. You realize that textbook relation is restrictive. It only works for uniform temperature. So that blowtorch experiment that I told you about or air conditioning, you know, with this blows cold air into the hot room, that right there is no longer going to apply. You can't solve those problems with your undergraduate textbook. Okay, so now let's go back to this idea that Coleman and all said. How do we constrain these functions of state? Just to uh, distinct the classical result of the textbook, it is also uh, valid for a differential element, right? So you can think of the whole continuum as being parts of differential elements, and that law will essentially result in the same thing with the differential. You're element. being very generous, and I accept your generous interpretation. <laughs> Arvind gave us a generous interpretation of the classical approach. So now let's introduce a concept that everybody in every other field of thermodynamics knows except mechanical engineers, which is free energy. Material scientists know it. Biochemists know it. Everybody else learns about free energy, but not mechanical engineers. I looked it up in the subject index of our textbooks that we use in undergrad. It's not even in the subject index. You cannot find free energy. Oh, what? Anyway. To be fair. Yes. <laughs> to be fair. Some of us never learned about enthalpy. <laughs> enthalpy. Yeah, I did that the first time pretty recently. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> this is like a data. Of course. Like a data. Have I mentioned it? Yeah. yeah. They haven't seen it yet. I'll tell you where it shows up. Many a discussion that he has. Uh, Basically, so now remember what I told you. R is an external user supply quantity. It doesn't come up naturally. It's not a function of state. It doesn't, it's not a property of a material like the stresses or the heat flux. So therefore, if you want to, you know, uh, only constrain the functions of state, you got to eliminate R from your equations. So we can eliminate it from the entropy and energy relations. So this is the entropy inequality where I, in differential form, I put all the terms on the same side of the inequality. This is the energy balance. I put all the terms on the same side. And, it, and I multiply the entropy inequality by the temperature because the absolute temperature is positive. Then I don't have to worry about the sign of the uh, greater than sign. And so now if I add these two, negative rho r plus positive rho r will cancel out. 
But then part of this div q over t will cancel out with this div q. And then this rho ts dot and rho u dot will combine. And when you combine them, you can actually judiciously combine them to bring in this concept of free energy, which is defined as the internal energy minus temperature times entropy. Okay, so I showed you the continuum approach and I showed you the way that free energy emerges as a way to eliminate the internal heat supply. Now, uh, Arvin should be happy to see that the stress power actually shows up in the entropy inequality. The beauty about this form, which uh, is a, the form that Truesdale called the clausius duhem inequality, Truesdale wrote a whole book on the history of thermodynamics where he ridiculed a lot of people Truesdell was a hated person by the people who knew him. I love him because I never met him. He died in 2000. I could have met him. I didn't. I know people who know him. <laughs> and they confirmed what I heard. <laughs> I, I just want to say. Okay. So anyway, but he gave credit to Klaus Yusendu and who had died long before he was born. So it, it was no problem. He could <laughs> give them credit. And so that's what it, it's called. It only contains the functions of state and what I call variables of state. Variables of state. You can measure temperature. You can measure the rate of deformation. Okay. Anyway, so you can see that all the functions of state show up here: the stress, the heat flux, the free energy, the entropy. And since the internal energy is related to the free energy and the entropy, so all the functions of state are represented in this inequality. Now let's do what Coleman and all did. Let's show how we use the second law of thermodynamics to constrain a particular, the behavior of a particular substance. Now I'm going to say it's time to pick. No more saying mixtures or solids or fluids. I'm going to stick to fluids, though they can be liquids or gases. So those, that's the assumption that I'm going to say. Pure fluid substance, which means liquid water or vapor water, but it has to be superheated steam. Wet steam doesn't qualify because it's a mixture of liquid water as tiny droplet and superheated steam. And reactions such as dissociation of water, sorry, you know, there's no pH, okay? H2O doesn't turn into H plus plus OH minus, okay? That doesn't happen in this. And no non-polar medium, okay? And for now, let's do what your undergraduate thermal textbook says, which is let's neglect viscosity. Why? It makes things a lot easier to, to explain. Okay, so now I need to decide what do my functions of state depend on? They depend on state variables. And here's another one of those things that I want to clarify that is not accepted uniformly in the literature. I say that the state variables must only be observable variables. You must be able to measure them, which means they must be related to the dimensions of space and time that we know, which is one dimension of space for scalars, two and three dimensional for area and volume or vectors, and then time. We have four dimensions, okay? Anything that you cannot calculate from those measurements is not observable. So temperature can be measured by the change of length of a calibrated metal like mercury or alcohol or whatever. Force can be measured by a calibrated material whose deformation you measure, you multiply by some kind of constant, the spring constant, you get the force. You understand? Because you can measure deformation and you can measure time. Okay, so <laughs> good. So to model fluids as pure substances, I want to include temperature because I want to look at thermoelastic fluids. And I want to measure volume as a strain volume ratio because I want to be able to measure, to relate the compressibility of a fluid to the pressure in it. I also want to allow heat to flow from high temperature to low temperature. So I'm going to introduce the gradient of the temperature as a state variable. Now you're going to tell me, but you already picked the temperature. Why pick the gradient? Because the gradient is a vector. The gradient of temperature is a vector, whereas the temperature is a scalar. So they can vary independently. The temperature could be this here, and then the vector could be anything that has nothing to do with the temperature, right? I can come to a different temperature, and the vector can assume any. So they're independent of each other for the purpose of this approach, which is the Coleman and all approach. OK. And then for now, because I decided that I don't want to include viscosity, I don't need to bring the rate of deformation tensor, which is a symmetric part of the gradient of the velocity. Can the right? Only if you want to do old fashioned undergraduate textbook thermodynamics. Arvin said you only need two state variables. Okay. So I want to do irreversible thermodynamics from the outset. I, I want reversible thermodynamics to be a special case only. 
Okay. Following Coleman and Null mostly, because Coleman and Null actually allow interchanging the entropy and the temperature between function of state and state variable. I don't allow it. Okay. So let's assume that all of these functions of state depend on all of these state variables that I picked. That's called the principle of equipresence in the continuum mechanics literature. This is my Clausius to M inequality. Of all the functions of state, only one of them has a material time derivative associated with it. So I'm going to say, well, a dot using the chain rule of differentiation will be this sequence of derivatives. Chain rule, very simple. But hey, remember we said j dot is equal to j div v, and the divergence of the velocity is equal to the trace of the rate of deformation tensor, which is also the rate of deformation tensor double dotted with the identity. I'm going to plug this back in here, then take this equation, put it back in here, and then group terms. I'm going to group terms where I have functions of state is one of the coefficient and variables of state as other coefficients. The variables of state appear in blue here, meaning that if I had, if I wanted to, I could include them as state variables, but so far I chose not to include them. And yet we want this whole expression to be positive, no matter what t dot and d and g dot and g are equal to. The blue variables are, can vary arbitrarily. So how can you make this entire expression positive while, you know, you know, maintaining arbitrary processes. That's the genius of Coleman and all. I'll, I'm going to show you on the next slide. Gerard, quick question. Yes. Okay. So if we neglect viscosity, yes. do you then allow uh, equivalent of shocks inside, which have, you know, hard to take derivatives of? Uh, the answer is, if I neglect viscosity, I then will introduce like sudden changes in some quantities. Yes. And yes, I will allow so those to are allowed to smooth anything over. But then I can have a non equilibrium process where temperature derivative is then hard to take. Uh, okay, so let me show you more and then you okay. can decide. Okay. okay. So the, the answer is what uh, I think one of the gems was saying. You make each of these terms positive because T dot is independent of D, is independent of G dot, is independent of G. Therefore, each one of these terms must be positive. But subject to our self-imposed constraint that these functions of state only depend on T, J, and G. So now let's look at this term here. I want the product of this with T dot to always be positive. Now, when the temperature increases, T dot is positive. When the temperature decreases, T dot is negative. So if this depended on T dot, I can always switch the sign of this to be the negative of the temperature of T dot, but this does not depend on T dot. It only depends on T and J and G. Therefore, it must be equal to zero, which means the entropy is the negative of the rate of change of free energy with temperature, which is usually described as a standard thermodynamic relation. But remember what I said, we made the assumption that there's no dependence on T dot. You will not find a single paper that assumes that T dot is a state variable. But I'm just saying, now that we were establishing the foundations of how we do continuum thermodynamics, you could if you wanted to, if the experiments warranted. The same thing is true for this term. None of these depend on D because we decided to neglect viscosity. We decided not to include D as a state variable. So sigma is equal to this scalar times the identity tensor. We can call this scalar the negative of the pressure. Okay. So this is what in solid mechanics would be called hyperelasticity relation. The stress is related to the strain. The strain in our case is a scalar, but in solid mechanics, it would be a tensor. And then P here is my fluid pressure is also related to the rate of change of the free energy, but this time with volume. So rate of change of free energy with each of the state variables is an important quantity. It recovers things that we already know, like entropy and pressure. But this term here, where is it? This one. DADG, A doesn't depend on G dot, therefore DADG must be zero, which means that A really only depends on temperature and volume rich. Okay. And so, however, Q does depend on G. So the dot product with G means you're left with a statement that you cannot just set equal to zero. We call this the residual dissipation statement, means that the second law of thermodynamics doesn't automatically reduce to zero, which means anytime you have heat flowing in your system, it's an irreversible process. I'm tying loose ends. You don't find textbooks that say this, but you do find a lot of people who understand that when you allow large temperature gradients, then you must be doing irreversible you know, thermodynamics. 
I'm giving you the proof right here. It's very simple. It stays in the residual dissipation statement, which means it's irreversible. Okay. So how do we come up with a consistent model for it? Well, you want Q dotted with G to be negative, right? I put the sign, there was a negative sign, okay? And so you can say, let Q be proportional to G. Because it's a fluid, the proportionality doesn't have to be a tensor, it could be a scalar. And this scalar is known as the thermal conductivity of the fluid. If this were a solid, it would have to be a second order tensor. And then all you have to do is say, fine, if I plug this consistent relation in here, then I can satisfy the residual dissipation as long as my thermal conductivity is always positive. So if someone says to you, why is the thermal conductivity always positive? The answer is the second law of thermodynamics says so. Okay, it's as simple as that. Okay, and by the way, if you specifically decide that you don't want a dependence on G, you recover Fourier's law of heat conduction. This is a classical approach. I'm not showing you anything new, okay? Everything here is already published a long time ago by Fourier. Okay. But the important thing here is heat flow. So heat conduction, now we understand Q is really not just the heat flux, it's what we normally understand to be heat conduction, okay? It's a dissipative process. And in your thermodynamics class, you never hear about the, you know, conductive, con, you know, heat conduction, right? So that means that everything you do in your heat transfer class is actually irreversible thermodynamics. Everything you do in your the thermodynamics class is reversible. Why? Because you don't allow a gradient of temperature to exist. If there is no gradient of temperature, there's no dissipative process. We already showed that you know you satisfy the residual dissipation. Q would be zero if there's no gradient in temperature as a state. Oh, so Gerard, I think the implication is that the way we compute this irreversibility sometimes in the thermodynamics class is probably flawed, right? Because it doesn't take into account this, uh, the fact that you can have a gradient. Okay, so I went back to Moran and Shapiro, an undergraduate textbook that has been used for our Meki students. And they specifically say that a large gradient in temperature would violate the reversibility assumption of the textbook. Got it, okay. But how they concluded that, they don't explain, right? Because it's the early in the chapter, like in early in the book, okay. So what if we decided to model viscosity? I want to just do this quickly. So we include D as a state variable, so we have one more. We follow exactly the same procedure this time because the stress does depend on D. You can no longer say the stress is not negative PI. There's an additional term tau, which depends on D, which stays in the residual dissipation statement. We then understand that that's the viscous stress, okay? So that means that you have an additional term, viscosity and heat conduction, are sources of irreversibilities, which is why both are neglected in your undergraduate thermal class. And then if you go back to the energy balance, suddenly you have this additional term, which is the viscous power density, the viscous dissipation, the heat generated by the viscosity of the fluid. The reason why if you stir a cup of tea and you take out the spoon, eventually the tea will come to a stop because of this energy dissipation, okay? So anyway, I wanted to, and then notice how this heat supply is just like this, Rho R. So if you had decided to do classical thermodynamics and you said, I don't want to include viscosity, I don't want to include temperature gradients, the only way in undergraduate thermal to have a heat supply is through this term, which is why I'm telling you it's the equivalent of Q dot in your undergraduate thermal class. Okay. Finally, I'm ready to talk about interfaces. Okay. So we only have 10 minutes left, but I'm going <laughs> to go through this as quickly as I can. Now, what we have is Interfaces are typically like a shock wave is an interface or a phase boundary between liquid and vapor or between ice and liquid, okay? So we are gonna draw it as a mathematical surface, but we're going to derive what are the jump conditions by applying these integral statements I showed you for the axiom of mass, momentum, and energy balance and the axiom of entropy inequality. I'm gonna apply them over this volume I'm not going to show you the details, and then shrink this volume down to a surface. When we do this, we recover these jump conditions that have been in the literature forever. The papers I found, the earliest papers I find are from the 1960s, but these are all for mixtures, which means the stuff has been around much longer than that. I just couldn't find a good reference for the jump condition. Okay, it says that the mass flux relative to gamma must be conserved in the direction normal to gamma. Gamma is my interface, right? Any mass that enters on one side has to exit on the other side. Very simple. 
We use these double brackets to indicate the jump between a quantity on the positive side, on the plus side, and the negative side. The plus side has its outward normal is n gamma, which is the normal to the interface. This is the exact opposite of the convention in every continuum mechanics <laughs> paper. I, for some reason, started out by you know, using f plus minus f minus because I decided n gamma points away from the plus region. All the other books make n gamma point into the plus region. I don't like that. Anyway, I just want you to know. So there will be a, a sign difference between my results and those in other papers. Okay, let's just explain this. There's a velocity to the interface. The easiest way, think of an ice cube that's sitting on this table and melting. The ice cube is not moving. So the velocity of the ice, which is V, is zero. But the boundary of the ice cube is shrinking as it melts. So the boundary of the ice cube is a velocity. That velocity is V down. You understand? Okay. Or if you have a shock wave, and the shock wave is propagating, like in front of a, uh, the nose cone of a plane that's flying at supersonic speeds, there's a shock wave that's moving, right? That has, is, that's the velocity of the interface. Okay. The, the, the freezing interface. The freezing interface that we just saw, exactly. Okay, now the momentum jump says that the uh, force exerted by the pressure, the traction, plus the momentum flux, this rho u gamma dotted with n gamma is the mass flux times the diffusive velocity across the interface is called the momentum flux. So the uh, traction plus momentum flux is conserved across the interface. That's for non-reactive interface like the shock wave. And here's the, where the enthalpy shows up for the very first time. It shows up naturally when you do the jump condition. It turns out that u combines with p over rho. And that's what you know, thermodynamicists have decided to call enthalpy. So if you don't know what the meaning of enthalpy is, it's the quantity that naturally arises on the jump <laughs> interface. That's all, okay? That's all it is. So what we're saying is the enthalpy flux, because enthalpy times the mass flux, rho u gamma dot n gamma, plus the diffusive kinetic energy flux, meaning the kinetic energy of only the mass that's diffusing across the boundary, plus the heat flux, is conserved. That's what the energy balance is. Okay. So in this case, you're restricting it to mostly flattish interfaces with surface tension. I am neglecting surface tension. That was the last point. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Arvind is on top of things I, as I expected he would. Okay, good. Now let's continue. The next one is the jump condition on the entropy inequality. And that's the fascinating one. It's been in the literature for a long time, but I'm going to say hardly anyone has used it for anything. That's what this talk is all about. We only have nine minutes left. But I'm... <laughs> so the entropy inequality jump comes from applying the same principle. So you recognize this says that the entropy flux due to mass flux, right? Rho u gamma dot n gamma is the mass flux. So the entropy flux due to mass flux plus the entropy flux due to heat flux is always going to be negative relative to this direction. Right, n gamma gives you a direction. So this inequality sign is relative to the n gamma using the f plus minus f minus, you know, uh, criterion that I explained, uh, rule. Okay, so, but the important thing here is the following. We already constrained s and q in the domain v plus and v minus using the second law of thermodynamics previously. I already told you s is minus partial of a partial of t and q is, for example, minus k times g. So we already constrain them. Why do I need another constraint? And that's the key. This is where we have to tie the loose ends. These are the things that I think have not been explained sufficiently in textbooks or papers. This is a constraint on processes that occur across an interface. Let me explain this. The most common and simplest process across an interface like this for non-reactive interface is the normal shock wave across, let's say, a stationary shock wave. Let's say you have a conversion divergent nozzle that, you know, you have a pressure tank. Think of the supersonic wind tunnel in the lab, right? You have convergent divergent nozzle. So now the air coming out of the nozzle is supersonic. It will spontaneously turn into subsonic flow. It's a well known fact. So that's what we're examining. That's the shock wave between, let's say, supersonic and subsonic. Then you might ask me, what if there's a shock wave between subsonic and supersonic? Can can we have a spontaneously you know, increasing from subsonic to supersonic speed? Let's find out. 
So if we do the mass balance, momentum balance, and energy balance, but we assume that the gas is an ideal gas with constant specific heat capacities, we can solve for the downstream temperature, volume ratio, and velocity, assuming we know the upstream temperature, um, volume ratio, and velocity. We're also gonna make the assumption, which is the common assumption in this problem, that everything is uniform upstream, everything is uniform downstream, which means there's no gradient in temperature, which means the heat flux is zero, keep that in mind. You solve for this, you get a classical solution that is in textbooks, even though they don't use the jump condition like that. But anyway, it's the same exact solution. This is the Mach number. This is the uh, ratio of specific heat capacities, the isobaric to isochoric specific heat capacity. Now let's look at the entropy jump. Remember what I told you, it places a constraint on the process. So if you actually look at the entropy jump and you substitute the constant relation for the entropy in here, you find this expression and I plotted it for you. I plotted it for you in terms of the Mach number of the upstream domain. So if the upstream domain is subsonic, then the jump in entropy is positive. If the, if the upstream flow is supersonic, then it's negative. If S is positive and you want the flow to be from left to right, that means that you want your rho u gamma dot n gamma to be positive, right? So what happens is that there's no way to get, so if Q is zero, which it is, you want rho S u gamma dot n gamma to be negative to satisfy the second law. But if the flow is positive to the right, you cannot have S be in the positive range. It can only be in this range. That means that you can only have a spontaneous, you know, uh, flow go from supersonic to subsonic. okay? When I say sub, uh, spontaneous, I mean without the addition of heat. Everyone who knows anything about jet engines knows that for fighter, play, uh, fighter planes, we have this post-combustion you know, opportunity to inject more fuel into the gases that are coming out. You can actually, if you inject more fuel and ignite it, you add heat, you can make the flow go from subsonic to supersonic. That's not what we call spontaneous, okay? Good. So now you understand that the jump in entropy inequality serves to constrain processes. Now let's talk finally about phase transformations. This goes back to Stefan from 1891, even though Stefan didn't use the continuum approach. So I'm gonna take these equations that I just showed you, but I'm applying them now to a reactive interface. So far, I showed you non-reactive interfaces. The only reaction I'm gonna allow is one mole of liquid turns into one mole of vapor or vice versa, okay? Which means I need to use mixture theory, but only on the interface because I have only liquid on one side, only vapor on the other side. So I minimal introduction of mixture theory. So I'm gonna use these papers. And what they say is now the mass flux needs to have a mass supply on the interface. Why? Well, if the ice is melting, then you're turning ice into water right on the interface. So you're producing liquid water. That's the mass supply we're talking about. If you're evaporating liquid water into vapor water, you're producing vapor. That's the mass flux we're talking about, okay? But this is a general relation from mixture theory. It makes it look like you need a row bar alpha, a constituent model for each constituent, liquid and vapor. But there's also stoichiometry. One mole of liquid water will turn into one mole of vapor water, and this net stoichiometric coefficient is either plus one or minus one for either side of the interface. When you do this, you end up with, I want to emphasize, a molar flux, which multiplied by the molar mass will give you the mass flux. We mechanical engineers love to do things with mass fluxes, not molar fluxes, but you can go back and forth. I'm gonna from now on use M zeta bar to represent the phase transformation flux. So the jump conditions can now be taken under the special case that you see here with the special stoichiometry of phase transformation of a pure substance, no combustion here on an interface, okay? then I can plug it into those jump conditions and I get relations that have been described in the literature. The jump in the velocity is proportional to the mass flux and the jump in the reciprocal of the mass density. And remember, the mass density of liquid water is much higher than the mass density of vapor water. So this jump here can be very large. The momentum jump says that there's a jump in pressure proportional to the square of the molar flux, the mass flux. So it doesn't matter in which direction it goes, because the density of liquid water is always higher than that of vapor water, the pressure in the liquid will always be higher than the pressure in the vapor, no matter which direction, whether you have evaporation or condensation. And this is the energy jump. 
Once again, mass flux term multiplying the enthalpy plus the diffusive kinetic energy and then plus the heat flux. Okay. And the beauty about this is you can always go back to phase equilibrium. Phase equilibrium is when you say that whatever reaction of evaporation or condensation has come to stop naturally. Okay. Then all you have to do is take this zeta, m zeta bar, set it to zero in every one of these equations. You find that the velocity is continuous across the interface, the pressure is continuous. And the heat flux is continuous, which is what you always assume in your heat transfer class. You have a solid that's being heated. You have a fluid that's convecting the heat away, but you assume the heat flux is continuous. That's true as long as it's not ice and water. Okay. If it's ice and water, forget it. You've got to take into account this additional term. that comes. All right. We're almost there. Oh, and by the way, these jump conditions in this modern notation appear in all of these papers. So these papers I discovered after I taught my class, but they still don't do what I do. So I just want you to know, I'm giving them credit, but I, <laughs> they did not solve the problem. Okay, now let's talk about specific latent heat of transformation. Specific only means per mass. Transformation in this case means evaporation condensation, the phase transformation. And latent heat is the heat you need to evaporate liquid water or the heat you're going to produce when vapor water condenses, for example. Okay, so that's the latent heat. So the energy jump, which I repeated here, gives you the mass flux, the enthalpy jump, and you know, diffusive kinetic energy and the heat flux. By definition, the latent heat is the ratio of these two. Although I don't think anyone has ever written it this way. I'm telling you, if you go on Wikipedia and you look up latent heat, because I couldn't find latent heat in any of the textbooks. <laughs> you go on Wikipedia and they tell you it's the ratio of heat, they put it as Q. You know, Q dot over M dot. They don't tell you where the Q or the M, but it's an interfacial process. So it's the jump in heat flux divided by the mass flux. And if you use the energy jump, it tells you that the latent heat is actually this jump, the sum of the enthalpy jump and the diffusive kinetic energy. But in your engineering, in thermodynamic textbooks, the latent heat is usually taken in the limit as the phase transformation approaches equilibrium, phase equilibrium. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you a few. Yeah. U gamma is really the, it's just the velocity of the, of the species on either side of the interface. It's not the interface. It's velocity. the relative velocity of the species relative to the interface. interface. So if the interface is moving, yeah. you have a relative velocity. Yes. So um, let me say that this jump condition, if you have the product of two terms, you can show mathematically that it's exactly equal to the mean value of F on the interface, we'll call it F gamma, is one half of F plus plus F minus times the jump in G plus the jump in F times the mean value of G. Okay, so just straightforward. If I apply this to the mass and momentum balance, then I can actually I can show that the diffusive kinetic energy jump is related to the mass flux in this manner. So obviously, then if you let the mass flux go to zero, then this expression will reduce to this. This L0 is what's reported in your thermodynamic tables, not this L. This L is valid for irreversible thermodynamics. That's the part that I don't think has been described in the literature, but again, you, I could be wrong. There's so many people who have done thermodynamics over the century. Okay, and then this is just another way of rewriting this expression. So this is not the special case L0. Okay, I'm getting closer to, and this jump condition for the energy is also known as the step factor. Okay. Now the entropy inequality jump applied to a phase transformation. We're finally getting to what I want. This is the full form of the entropy jump. General case, nothing special, okay? So the mass flux times the jump in the entropy is plus the uh, entropy flux due to heat must be negative. At phase equilibrium, all I have to do is set M zeta bar to zero. Then that means that the phase equilibrium conditions are this. This is what's going to help us explain supercooled fluid, right? I'm going to get to it in a second. So we also know from the energy jump that the heat flux should also be continuous at phase equilibrium. I just showed that to you. So those are two separate things. One is the entropy inequality. The other one is the energy jump, which is an equation. So if you combine these two, then what you end up is you can take the heat flux out of this jump condition because it's continuous. And so what you have is the jump in one over the temperature times the heat flux must be negative. So it re regulates all phase equilibria, including metastable states. And this is the tying the loose ends. I am convinced that someone must have thought of this, but I haven't seen it written anywhere. 
Okay, so let's look at three possible cases. One is, let's say the temperature is continuous, in which case the jump in the one over T is zero. Then it says, if the temperature is continuous, the heat can flow in either direction. It doesn't matter, which makes perfect sense. It doesn't violate anything we, you know. What if we assume the heat flux is zero? Then it says, then it doesn't matter what the temperature is, it is on either side. If the heat cannot flow, let's say you have an adiabatic interface or insulated interface, then it doesn't matter if the temperature on one side is higher and lower. It's not going to flow from high to low because it cannot flow. You, right? And if, on the other hand, the heat flows, let's assume it flows in the n gamma direction. If it's positive, then according to this jump condition, if q dot n gamma is positive, then 1 over t must be negative. 1 over T jump is negative, which means T plus should be greater than T minus because this is the reciprocal. Okay, so now let's explain how supercooling can occur. Remember, you put this bottle of water in the fridge. When you put the bottle of water, the water and the air above it were all above freezing temperature. The volume of air here is much smaller. So you can assume that the temperature at the tip of the bottle probably went down faster than the temperature in the water even though the thermal conductivity, the specific heat capacity are different, but the volume difference is huge, okay? So that means that you can have heat flowing from the high temperature to the low temperature, which is this condition here, right? But there's nothing that says that the uh, temperatures must be the same, right? You could have this temperature is higher than this one. Remember, if this is negative five degrees Celsius, this could be negative three. So it's a super cool fluid, and it's not undergoing a phase transformation. So we satisfy this jump condition, which is valid even at phase equilibrium, okay? So this is before you shake the bottle. Once you shake the bottle, you need to have M zeta bar is not zero, okay? So I just wanted to explain to you that you can explain metastable states this way. So that's metastable states. It's great. You never talk about these. This particular case though, you're kind of, in the bottom, you have air also. In yes, there. so that's correct. Fine. I agree. We need more measurements. <laughs> I'm going to show you. Now let's look specifically not at phase equilibrium, but near phase equilibrium, which is what thermodynamic textbooks cover. Okay, now let's use that simple rule I told you. So whenever you have entropy flux, you can write it as the one over the mean temperature times the jump in the heat flux, plus the jump in one over the temperature times the mean heat flux. Okay, so we apply this and then we assume that the phase transformation is approaching equilibrium, which means the pressure is going to be almost continuous. The jump in this quantity is almost equal to the enthalpy. And the energy jump now has simplified because this term has been neglected. So this is what it looks like. But the entropy inequality, this is no approximation yet, is still a complicated relation. How can I make sense of it? We already talked about the entropy inequality a moment ago for phase equilibrium, where we allowed the change in difference in temperature. Now let's look at the case where we assume that the temperature is continuous because that's what you learn about in your thermal class. Then if the temperatures are almost the same, then this one over T term here will be zero, which means this whole term is zero. This T gamma is equal to T plus T minus, so I can bring the T inside the jump and then everything else, Right, I can, you know, the T gamma is positive, so I can cancel it out. So I'm left with M zeta bar times H minus TS, the jump in H minus TS must be positive. And this is the beauty. Naturally, H minus TS turns out to be this function that everybody outside of mechanical engineering knows as the Gibbs free energy, but there's no such thing as Gibbs free energy. The literature has evolved. Now they call it the Gibbs function. The only free energy is the one that Helmholtz discovered. That's the one we called A earlier. Helmholtz and Gibbs, two different people, one in America, the other one in Germany. Okay, I'll let you guess which one. Okay, so anyway, the point is Gibbs is famous for having cleaned up all the field of thermodynamics as we know it. But one could argue that really what he solved was thermostatics. Now I sound like Truzel. Okay, so anyway, H minus yes. It's called a free enthalpy in the modern literature. Why? Because you can say H is U plus P over rho, but um, U minus TS is A. So A plus P over rho is equal to H minus TS. So this is free energy plus P over rho. Sounds like enthalpy, we call it free enthalpy. You see? There's no extra meaning to it other than that. <laughs> okay. And now let's see. If I want evaporation, that means I want, let's say I assume the plus side is liquid, the minus side is vapor. Then I want M zeta bar to be positive, which means the jump in G must be positive. 
If I want condensation, then I want M zeta bar negative, which means the jump in G should be negative. So as I approach first phase equilibrium, then I assume that the jump in G should be zero. Okay. And that is a classical result of phase transformations that the Gibbs function, this free enthalpy, is continuous across an interface, but only at phase equilibrium. So G only emerged when I assumed that the temperatures were the same. Before that, it didn't emerge. H, the enthalpy, only emerged when I looked at the jump in the energy balance. It didn't emerge from the energy balances. And if you go and download the thermodynamic property, so I'm going to once again be on the saturation curve between liquid water and vapor water. You download the properties uh, from thermodynamic tables online from NIST, the best kept secret. I didn't know this existed when I was a student. It's like really convenient. And you calculate G because G is not provided in those thermodynamic tables, but H and T and S are provided. You find that the liquid and the vapor fall right on top of each other, which is not surprising, which means this result has been known for a long time. This is known by that, that result that you showed in the context of chemical potential. They do have the Did chemical potential show up in my derivations. No, not, but the Gibbs function. I know, the, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. And I know all about chemical potential. Yes. That's what I've done in my research, but it doesn't show up here. Good. I'm finally getting to the punchline we're already behind time side. So remember that the mass flux is a function of state. Now we have a function of state involved on the interface. So that means that the entropy inequality should be used to constrain it. The entropy inequality jump is used to constrain processes occurring across an interface. Therefore, this is the time to do it. You also need to make sure that whatever constant model you pick for M zeta bar satisfies this condition that, you know, um, the constant model must produce zero mass flux when we have stable phase equilibrium, which means G is continuous, which means the temperature is continuous, which means the heat flux is continuous. Can you think of a constant model that satisfies all of these? The answer is don't think too hard. Just take this inequality, turn it into an equation. That's the missing step. Even though people have been aware of this inequality, no one made that assumption that I'm making. And you must think to yourself, George, you know nothing. You're not a thermodynamicist. What makes you think you're allowed to do that? The answer is years of having to teach this material to students it tells me I must be right. But I can't trust just my instincts. Okay. Anyway, so then what does that mean? It means I'm satisfying both constraints because obviously if the temperature is continuous and heat flux is continuous, this term will be zero, which means M zeta bar will be zero. So it satisfies this constraint. And it obviously satisfies this inequality, but in the special case when it's equal to zero, which means I'm assuming that the interface itself is non-dissipated. And you might think, well, all this time we've been talking about irreversible thermodynamics, now you're giving us a reversible case. But remember, it depends on the heat flux, which is only non-zero if you have a temperature gradient which means you have irreversible processes on either side of the interface. So the phase transformation is still an irreversible process. Just saying that the interface itself is conservative is non dissipated It doesn't mean that the process is reversible, okay? Okay, so now, and there's a bonus, which I had never seen before. If you plot the entropy of liquid water and vapor water, um, usually this curve is flipped in most thermodynamic textbooks. So this is the entropy versus temperature. You notice that they come to coincide at the critical point, which means that the jump in the entropy is zero. But if the jump in the entropy is zero, then the, this reactive flux of transformation becomes singular. And that means, therefore, you cannot sustain either state above the critical point. And that's the beauty. I, I don't think I've ever seen this described anywhere. I don't think there's any thermodynamic paper or textbook that explains this. This comes from this nice relation. We need experimental data. So, the only paper that I found that only deals with water and gives me temperature gradients, heat fluxes, and temperature across an interface is by this guy, Badam Erat. Badam actually worked at some point with uh, Ward that I mentioned earlier on, but this work he did on his own when he was a postdoc in Germany. So, basically, he's got a little bit of liquid water coming in in a super cooled state, and he's got a heating element here that helps you heat up the vapor side. There's no air, it's only liquid water and vapor water. And he measures the temperature with, with this tiny thermocouple with a diameter of 25 microns, which he moves up and down. This surface is curved because of surface tension, but he measures the temperature across, okay? And this is a typical profile. 
okay, that he gets. The water temperature becomes cooler as you approach the surface, whereas the vapor temperature becomes warmer as you approach the heat element. This is a contradiction, not contradiction, but the non-intuitive outcome that Arvind was mentioning. I don't have an answer for it. Um, <laughs> other than it satisfies the jump conditions. Okay, now let's validate our jump. Right? That's the only data I could find in the literature. So here's the formula I told you. This is the constant model I'm proposing. Now let's recognize that S, the jump in S is the liquid minus the vapor entropy, but the liquid entropy is almost zero near the triple point, which is where we are. So let's assume that it's mostly the vapor pressure. And then let's take this vector equation and just put it in terms of scalar quantities. That's, there's no assumption here. So now what I'm saying is I should end up with a linear relation between this and the uh, mass flux. And Bada measured the mass flux and measured each one of these quantities. The heat flux is on both sides as well as the temperature. So let's plot Bada's you know, data against this formula and let's see if we get the straight line that this predicts. Ta da! <laughs> <laughs> wow! And this must. There are students in this class who are like, but wait a minute, professor, I took this as a final exam. You know, for the thermal class that you talked, I'm like, yeah, sorry, I didn't realize I was discovering something. <laughs> Apparently, what I thought was just a simple problem I was giving you was not published before. Okay. Anyway, we get a perfect straight line with r squared is 0 0.9893, the regression coefficient. So that means it's very good. However, the slope is about 5,900 kilo uh, joule per kilogram Kelvin, and unfortunately, that's not the value of the vapor entropy. In the range that they're doing their experiments, I can actually calculate it using ideal gas law. It's in this range. So that's the only discrepancy. So- You just missed the factor of two. So no, I didn't. I, I thought about it. I, you know, I've been complaining to, you know, but basically what it comes down to is they measured the mass flux over this entire surface. And, you know, but they measure the heat flux and the temperature at a single line. It's a, so they essentially generalize what is a really three-dimensional problem into a one-dimensional problem. That's the most likely explanation. To convince myself of that, I went back and I checked whether their results satisfy the energy jump, which by the way, I did not create, I did not invent. It doesn't. So they have the same issue comes up that they don't satisfy the energy jump, okay? So that means, okay, anyway. So this is the data that I have. There's no other data. If you want to run more experiments, I've got an undergraduate, maybe she's listening in, you know, Yumna, uh, who's actually going to help me set up these experiments because I don't have funding to do this kind of research. Okay, <laughs> let's talk a little bit more about, you know, the, how does this work? So this is a more extensive set of the Bada metal data. They, the heating element is raised at different temperatures. So they have multiple curves. They, that's why there's so many points on that curve that I showed you. So let's say that the interface is defined. This is the liquid at the bottom, the vapor at the top, and n gamma is positive going up, consistent with the sign of the height, you know, negative, downward, positive. So now let's take a look. We know that the, they're only measuring evaporation, so the mass flux is positive, and we know that the entropy of the vapor is positive, which means, according to this constant relation, the, this jump in the entropy flux must be positive. Now, the Temperature gradient is negative, meaning the temperature decreases with increasing coordinate, which means the heat flux is positive because it's the negative of the proportional to the negative of the temperature gradient. So it's actually going up. And if you do the same with the temperature gradient and the vapor, it's actually the temperature gradient is positive, so the heat flux is negative. So that means both the liquid flux is positive and the vapor flux is negative, which means both of these terms are going to be positive. You don't have to worry about the relative magnitude. It's always going to be positive. So I just wanted to emphasize this one. Now let me tell you what did Bader and Al say in their paper. Did they plot anything like the curve that I showed you? No. Remember, they're testing out the the nuts and hertz nuts and theory or nuts and hertz nuts and shrug. Okay, the theory does not provide consistent results as their complaint in the discussion. They took the additional correction parameter that came from Schrag, the PhD student from chemistry who graduated in 1951. Apparently he had an award-winning dissertation because that's how I was able to look him up online because 1951 dissertations are not stored in the Columbia University Library. Anyway, and so they, they extracted this evaporation coefficient, which you see here, which is not a constant, depends on the vapor pressure, depends on the, um, and it, it varies significantly because this is a log scale. So I just want you to know that's the state of the art. 
And where versus my beautiful curve, I gotta show it to you. <laughs> I am so proud of it. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> you, you can tell I'm almost done. So so finally, I want to say the unfortunately the freezing of the water I cannot explain because I need a more complete data set, right? And it's air, it's air vapor mixture, plus ice is a solid. And so enthalpy and pre-enthalpy, which is involves the pressure over rho, now involves the stress over rho. And the stress is a tensor, which means enthalpy and free enthalpy are tensors. And the fact that free enthalpy is a tensor can be found in the literature. I'm not the one who invented this, I'm just going to. Okay, in summary, I showed you these. No adjustable parameters, predicts per critical state. It's a fantastic relation, I'm very happy, compared to Hertzsons. <laughs> And I want to thank my students, especially, you know, uh, Jay Shen, who was the TA for my advanced thermal class, and who double checked all my calculations. <laughs> <we're done. laughs> but Jay had the time and the energy. He's a co author on the paper, who's, which is still in review. I had a hard time publishing the paper, but it, the review is progressing. Thank you, and sorry for taking care.